Jehovah's Witnesses just released something they call the Governing Body Update Number 2. That's the name of this video. And they're making a lot of changes right now. They want the changes to seem groundbreaking and serious. As I'll explain in a little while, they're facing a court battle right now in Norway. And they are losing. It does not look good for them at all. So they're releasing updates like this, like what we're about to watch to try to kind of mitigate damage and convince the Norwegian government that they really do have, you know, they have good intentions and they're not scumbags and everything. Again, failing miserably at their attempt to convince anybody of that. But, you know, let's listen, because they actually did make some changes, and I found the changes kind of interesting. In fact, I listened through some of it, not all of it, but, yeah, let's check this out. I edited it down, try to shorten it up. Welcome to our update. How did the 2023 annual meeting affect you? It was uh, the 2023 meeting that they're referring to. It was a big deal. They made a bunch of changes to their eschatology, meaning their end times beliefs. They weren't really fundamentally like groundbreaking for the outside world. It's like, okay. But for Jehovah's Witnesses, it's like, oh my God. Like, originally in the 2023 annual meeting, before that happened, they believed if the end came, like, if the Great Tribulation started and there's a seven-year period where, you know, people are going to be persecuted and at the end of it, God's going to Armageddon, middle, 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 blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. Well, they opened it up so that if ex-Jehovah's Witnesses see the signs and, you know, recognize it and know, oh, this is the end. You know, we're watching all these things play out exactly as the governing body claimed. We, then we can rejoin as ex-Jehovah's Witnesses when we see the signs. So it's a pretty fundamental change for Jehovah's Witnesses, but not really the outside world. Oh, and they also allowed beards. That's another thing. Oh, by the way, let me give a little teaser here. Um, apparently women are allowed to wear pants. They're allowed to wear pants. So stick around to the end of the video if you want to find out the context behind the the pants thing. Oh, and men don't have to wear ties or jackets anymore necessarily under some certain circumstances. So yeah, stick around. Okay, keep, just keep listening here. He mentions that meeting, the annual meeting, because there were so many changes. He's about to make more. The annual meeting affect you. Remember the information that highlighted Jehovah as the merciful judge of all the earth? We were thrilled to learn that individuals who died in the flood of Noah's day, in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Dude, they speak so weird, don't they? Uh, well, after being on the outside of this religion for, uh, God, how long has it been? I was 18. So somewhere around 16 years I've been out. Mentally, I've been out for about 13 years. 2007 is when I officially got this fellowship, I think. After leaving, after all that time and listening to them talk, I now recognize the way that they talk is weird. It's just odd. Anyway, part of the announcement that they gave was that the people who died in Sodom and Gomorrah, the people who died in Noah's flood and others are not barred from surviving Armageddon or barred from like making it out the other side into the Garden of Eden 2.0 that they believe in. The answer really is we don't know. So the governing body changed the answer. People in Sodom and Gomorrah and Noah's day who died in the flood, we don't know if they're going to make it through to Garden of Eden 2.0. That's the change from the annual meeting. Quick note before we continue, I want to let you know I just wrote a book. If you want to check it out, owenmorgan.com slash book. It's a book about my experiences within Jehovah's Witnesses. It's completely understandable if you know nothing about Jehovah's Witnesses. And if you're a Christian, it's a good reference to use for why Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong about their interpretation of the Bible. The last chapter of the book is 100 questions that I have for the governing body. I'm selling the last chapter separately as its own separate guide, if you guys want to get that too. So check it out, owenmorgan.com slash book. I'd appreciate that. Okay. In the flood of Noah's day, in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and even some who might repent during the Great Tribulation could benefit from Jehovah's mercy. That's the big one. Uh, that's led to a lot of 
ex-Jehovah's Witnesses receiving phone calls from their family members and stuff. Since hearing that information, have you found yourself thinking a lot about Jehovah's mercy? Well, so has the governing body. In our prayerful study, meditation, and discussions, we've focused our attention on how Jehovah has dealt with people who engaged in serious sin. Okay, I found this fascinating. So up to this moment, let me tell you how they've treated disfellowship people. Let me just tell you a brief history of my own disfellowshipping, okay? I was isolated as a child in ways that should never have happened. It was wrong what happened to me when I was little. Wrong. And you know what else was wrong? The CPS agent that kept coming back over and over and over. I don't know, maybe six times she came to my house. She should have done something long before she did. When I was a kid, I went through a lot of stuff, a lot of hard stuff. And by the time I turned 18, I just, I, get, I walked away. I was like, I, I, I can't do this right now. I believed it still. I was just at a point in my life where I needed to live my life and be who I am, find my identity, not Owen Morgan, Jehovah's Witness, but Owen Morgan. So I, you know, I got a girlfriend and I started hanging out with a crowd who drank alcohol and smoked cigarettes and things. And that was reported by one of the people who was in my high school. And the elders called me in for a judicial meeting. I stupidly showed up, agreed to sit down and talk to him. I, ex I admitted everything. I explained everything. They disfellowshipped me just like that. And what happened when I was disfellowshipped? They pull the rug out from under you and watch you fall flat on your face to serve as an example to the rest of the congregation. That seems to be the intent to me. My life was ruined when I was disfellowshipped. I was kicked out in 11th grade. Do you know how hard it is to try to maintain going to high school and holding down a full-time Burger King job to support myself? impossible. I couldn't. I had to drop out of school. So I, that's what I did. Thanks to Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses uh, at that time, 2007, it was a disfellowshipping offense to talk to other disfellowship people, family members or not. Now, from my understanding, in their most recent edition of the Elder's Handbook, which nobody's supposed to have access to except for elders, no one's even supposed to know about, Supposedly, they removed that little line. I mean, I haven't looked at it myself, so take that with a grain of salt. I think they removed that little line to protect themselves in this Norwegian case they're facing down right now. But it's still a cultural thing. It's a, it's a cultural touchstone. When someone's disfellowshipped, you ignore them. You shun them. You don't talk to them. Now, what are the governing body members going to do about it if you do talk to them? Assuming they removed it from the book, they're not, they're going to give you a bunch of shepherding calls. They're going to tell you this is a bad idea. You shouldn't be doing this. This is wrong. But technically, they can't disfellowship you for it. Everybody else in the congregation is going to be fully aware of what you're doing, but they can't disfellowship you for it. So everyone in the congregation is just going to kind of step away gradually. You know, that's how it works. Anyway, let's keep listening here. In this update, we'll briefly consider the pattern Jehovah set in the Bible record. Then... Now they're considering the pattern that Jehovah set. Jehovah's not God's name, by the way. It was Yahweh. Not going down that road right now. I have plenty of examples on my channel of me explaining why Yahweh is God's name, not Jehovah. I also talk about it in my book, if you want to check it out, owenmorgan.com slash book. I talk about it in chapter one. It's a big section about it. Anyway, they didn't care, uh, or they didn't seem to think that Jehovah was merciful up until literally five minutes ago. Well, not literally. You know, whenever this governing body update released, um, mid-March 2024, up to that moment... They pretended that Jehovah was not merciful. They pretended he was hateful and vengeful and wanted to destroy people's lives. 
So let's continue listening to them talk about his mercy all of a sudden and seemingly out of the blue. Quick interjection, this won't take long. If you like what I do, it would be awesome if you guys checked out my Patreon. All links are in the description, of course. Okay, back to the video. In serious sin. In this update, we'll briefly consider the pattern Jehovah set in the Bible record. Then we'll just uh, Shouldn't you have done that like years ago? Then we'll discuss some new information regarding the way we'll handle cases of wrongdoing in the Christian congregation. This is actually pretty groundbreaking stuff, and I'll explain it as we go along. 2 Peter 3, verse 9, tells us... By the way, this is a shortened version. I cut out a bunch of stuff, like, I don't know, a few minutes worth. Anytime you see a cross fade, like it fades to black and fades back into the film, that's me making a cut. If you see other cuts, that was them. Tells us that Jehovah does not desire anyone to be destroyed, but desires all to attain to repentance. What does that teach us? It helps us understand that Jehovah wants people to repent and gain life. You know, Jesus, when he came to earth, he had one mission. His mission was to take care of the poor to love the sick and the elderly and do everything he could, give up all of his belongings and do for them, give of himself to help other people. His defining quality was love and caring, right? That was Jesus' defining quality. Now, the God of the Old Testament, he was a little bit different. He was a little more vengeful and uh, genocidal, if you will. And you can really tell somebody's moral system or their, their mindset by which God they tend to latch on to. Jehovah's Witnesses up to this point have been vengeful and, you know, pull the rug out from under you and want to watch you bloody your nose to serve as an example. That is Old Testament stuff. That's extreme stuff. Is that what Jesus was about? No. Jesus set an example by talking to the Samaritan woman, somebody who wasn't supposed to be talking to, right? Jesus would talk to anybody, would take care of anybody, love anybody, didn't care who. The defining feature, the thing that would get you into the kingdom of God, according to Jesus, from his lips to your ears, the sheep and the goats parable, the sheep would make it into the kingdom of God. To be a sheep, you had to do the following. Feed the hungry. Give people water when they're thirsty. Give them a place to sleep when they have nowhere to rest their head. That's it. That's all that's required. Suddenly, out of nowhere, these people have found the merciful verses in the Bible. Huh. Fascinating, right? I'm sorry. I'm not going to stop every 15 seconds. I just, I just feel like it was important to like draw this out a little bit, make this point. Repent and gain life. So now they're zeroing in on the love stuff. When the first human couple rebelled, they condemned the human race to sin and death. What did Jehovah do? He took immediate steps to help as many of their descendants as possible to... Uh, wait, so you're telling me that when Adam and Eve sinned, he took immediate steps to give Adam a vasectomy, move Adam and Eve to somewhere where there isn't a tree that can kill them when they eat it, and they can have, you know, as much they can have as much fun as they want in America, and he creates a brand new breeding pair in like China instead of the Middle East. That's what he did? No, that's not what he did. Fascinatingly, he decided, God decided to condemn Countless billions. How many people have lived on planet Earth so far? I think it's 110 billion, right? It, yeah, about 117 billion, I guess. I guess. Yeah, somewhere in that vicinity. 117 billion people. God condemned 117 billion people to painful, short, brutal lives where they do nothing but work themselves into the ground and they rest when they're dead. Thanks, God, for that one. Appreciate it. Great, great idea. To be honest with you, you know, atheism aside or whatever, I'm not even talking about that. The Adam and Eve story is false. You can be a Christian and not accept the Adam and Eve story. The book of Genesis is something called 
antiquity literature or archaeology literature in Greek. Antiquity literature is a Latin form. And it did not... It was basically that type of literature, that genre, that style, was effectively a set of anecdotes from a culture, just a set of stories from a culture, from a time period. And they wouldn't separate fact from legend, from fiction. They would just, you know, get any stories they could, campfire stories or whatever. You know, there's that story about the scorpion and the frog, and the scorpion tries to convince the frog to swim him across the the river or whatever. And the frog says, no, you're going to sting me, and then we're both going to die. He says, no, I'm not going to sting you, I promise. Like, just take me across the river. The frog says, I know you're going to sting me. And the scorpion says, I swear, I'm not going to sting you. So the frog says, all right, hop on back. The scorpion gets on. They get halfway through the lake. Scorpion stings the frog. They're both drowning. The frog says, why'd you do that? Now we're both going to die. And the scorpion said, because I'm a scorpion and that's what scorpions do. That's a tale told to children to make a point. Talking creatures and, uh, uh, you know, it's a parable with a moral lesson in it that bad people do bad things sometimes for bad reasons, just because they're bad people and that's it. Doesn't make it literally true. That literally did not happen, that story. That's basically how the book of Genesis came to be. And it's really like it's a compilation of like 10 different books, the book of Genesis is. They tell the same story multiple times and in multiple different ways. And it's all just a big collection of anecdotes and stories from the time. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Point is, Adam and Eve wasn't, wasn't real. This is just fictitious. But Jehovah's Witnesses are old earth creationists, so they necessarily believe Adam and Eve was a real story. Immediate steps to help as many of their descendants as possible to gain life. Through the sacrifice of Jesus. Like he didn't have to do any of that. Is he all powerful? He could have forgiven their sin. Boom. That's okay. My bad, guys. I put the tree in the middle of the garden. And I let snakes talk and gave them legs. Fixed it. Really? It's a story, guys. Come on. You can be Christian and not accept the Adam and Eve story. Jehovah arranged to cover the sins of all who would exercise faith and repent. Such ones can live forever. What about the nation of Israel? Jehovah kept appealing to them, even when they showed no desire to repent. At Ezekiel 30... So he's trying to make a point here that um, God forgave those even when they didn't repent, or even when their repentance was half-hearted, repentance being sorrow or whatever. The Bible actually says two different things in two different spots. Jesus says what you need to do to get into the kingdom of God is feed the poor, give water to the thirsty, give a home to the homeless, help people who are the weakest among us. He said, what you've done to the, uh, what was it? What you've done to the weakest of my family, you've done to me, or something to that effect. Later on, Paul, somebody who never met Jesus, came around tried to explain Jesus' death because Jesus didn't expect to die. This is historical fact now that I'm dealing with. His apostles didn't expect him to die, and everybody was freaked out. They were like, he's supposed to be the son of man. That means he's supposed to take political control of the area. That's a prerequisite to being the son of man. So what's going on? Is he going to save us or not? Is he the son of man or not? And Paul said, "Uh, he'll be back. He'll be back. Just wait and see. And uh, then he'll fulfill his role as son of man. All you have to do is have faith. So now we have two competing ideas. You have to physically do an action to get into the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. You have to take care of people, love people, feed people, give them water, help them any way you can, or Paul's way, which is simply believe. That's it. Now, where is all this repentance stuff coming from? What what are you talking about? Being sorry? What? No desire to repent. At Ezekiel 33, 11, Jehovah appeals to the nation of Israel. 
as surely as I am alive, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that someone wicked changes his way and keeps living. Okay, so God claims to wish that everybody would survive. Great. Well, I'm not sure why he ordered a genocide in that case. The governing body has prayerfully considered how Jehovah's mercy could be better reflected when dealing with wrongdoers in the congregation. Mercy, quote unquote. And that's led to a clearer understanding of three scriptures. Let's consider the first. All right. So Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, as they go through this, I think that yeah, so they they go through these you know these different scriptures, Second Timothy, so on and so forth, to try to justify the idea that maybe God didn't want you know people to be shunned. There's a verse in uh, what First Corinthians. That's the verse that Jehovah's Witnesses always go to when it comes to shunning. Historically, this is a as far as we can tell a historical fact. This is accepted by scholars. There was a guy in the congregation of Corinth, the Corinthian congregation, who was bragging about sleeping with his stepmother in that congregation. Again, something I talk about in my book at length. I break the whole thing down. I got sources and everything. OOMorgan.com slash book. Check it out. Anyway, so this dude's bragging about sleeping with his stepmother and sleeping with prostitutes and stuff, and he's doing it in church. Oops. So Paul writes his first letter to the Corinthian congregation, and he says, you got to kick this dude out. He's looking at, he's making us look terrible. The second letter to the Corinthians is his response to the Corinthian congregation. The Corinthian congregation said to him in response to that, this is harsh, dude. Like it's, it's not easy to shun somebody. This is miserable for everybody, for him, for us. We don't like this, this whole shunning thing. And it wasn't even like full-blown shunning the way that Jehovah's Witnesses do today. It's, it's just miserable. It's not fun for anybody. So Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthian congregation, 2 Corinthians, he says, you know what, guys? You're right. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Bring him back into the fold. We want to welcome him. We want to talk to him. We want him to be a part of our lives. We shouldn't be shunning people. That's not the way that God wants his church run. So Paul reversed course. Jehovah's Witnesses zero in on the 1 Corinthians verse and ignore everything after it, including the verse that they're now quoting, 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25. Huh, it's a bunch of stuff in the Bible that speaks out against shunning people. But they zero in on one verse. Why? Because they want to shun people. That's it. You can't not cherry pick the Bible. It's impossible. Every moral position can be found in the Bible. If you have a moral position, you will find the verses to back it up. And that's what they did. They found the ones necessary to shun people. For a slave of the Lord does not need to fight, but needs to be gentle toward all, qualified to teach, showing restraint when wronged, instructing with mildness those not favorably disposed, Perhaps God may give them repentance, leading to an accurate knowledge of truth. So what's the message 2 Timothy is trying to give here, also written by Paul, by the by? The message is, don't be a D-bag to people. If somebody wrongs you, or, or they have some kind of wrong understanding about something, or they don't agree with something, or whatever, don't be a D-bag. Treat them with mildness and favor, be favorable to them. Maybe by being nice and just being around them, they will come to an accurate knowledge of the truth. They'll, they'll come around, maybe. If you have them in your life, maybe they'll come around. Completely ignored that verse until this moment, by the way. This has been in the Bible the entire time. I guess they forgot this was in there or something. Okay, go on. So uh, Timothy says all that. This could include brothers and sisters in the congregation who disregard scriptural counsel. By the way, they gave like three different examples, and I cut them out because I I only left one in for time. And become involved in serious wrongdoing. Someone who gets involved in serious wrongdoing. Serious wrongdoing being disfellowshipping offense, commit adultery, smoke a cigarette. Uh, That's what I'm assuming that they're talking about here. Serious wrongdoing, right? 
um, engage in acts of violence, uh, like watching boxing on TV, for example, watching a boxing championship. I'm trying to think is, you know, I have a whole list of things that'll get you disfellowshipped in my book. Um, abortion is one of them under any circumstances, doesn't, know, doesn't matter what it is. Those are just some examples that I assume they mean when they say serious wrongdoing. Someone who gets involved in serious wrongdoing needs help from the elders. So a committee of elders meets with the wrongdoer. The goal of these elders isn't merely to judge whether the wrongdoer is repentant. He's talking about a judicial committee. Three elders designed to sit down with the person and coerce a confession out of them, basically. That's the goal. If they can't get enough evidence or if they can't get a confession, then there's no disfellowshipping. The wrongdoer is repentant, but also to act in harmony with 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25. The elders must correct and instruct the wrongdoer with mildness. What is their goal? Notice what another study note on 2 Timothy 2.25 says. Oh, by the way, another serious wrongdoing, quote unquote, would be getting a blood transfusion. That's not even technically in their, from what I've seen from their latest elders manual. I, I don't know this for a fact, so don't quote me. I think that getting a blood transfusion isn't even in the disfellowshipping category, it's in the disassociation category. So by taking a blood transfusion, you have disassociated yourself from Jehovah's Witnesses. You were the one that severed the relationship. I think that's super interesting that they, they categorize it that way. Anyway, sorry. Keep listening. When a Christian elder mild... Uh, by the way, the governing body member here is reading from the Silver Sword, the Jehovah's Witness translation, the New World translation. Don't trust the New World translation. They change words here and there to fit what they already believe. Be very skeptical anytime you read from this book. But okay, let's just read the study note anyway with that in mind. Christian elder mildly corrects or instructs those not favorably disposed. The good result may be repentance or a change of mind. The credit for such a change in thinking and attitude goes not to any human, but to Jehovah, who helps the wayward Christian make this vital change. Paul goes on to mention some of the beautiful results of such repentance. Okay, so the, the situation it sounds to me that they're describing is the judicial committee sits down with the person who's committed a serious wrongdoing. Let's say, uh, give you an example, I heard this about, all right, let me, I'm just going to say it. I'm sorry. I heard this about my mom recently. There's a disagreement between my mom and the rest of the car group. And the disagreement is like on semantics and confusing and nonsensical, but it's kind of led my mom to like a weird place where she completely disagrees with the society, with the Watchtower Society on it. Disagreement goes like this. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit in the Garden of Eden, did they know what they were doing or did they understand what they were doing? I don't understand the difference fully, but for I guess if I had to guess at it, I would say the difference would be, did they fully understand the consequences of what they were about to do and everything that it that entailed, everything that would follow, all of the suffering all of the repercussions, all the everythings. Did they understand when they ate the fruit? Or did they just know it was wrong? Simple as that. And I think my mom was on the side of they knew that there were the repercussions were dire. Within the context of the story, which is obviously fake, but let's just assume it's real for a moment, I think I kind of side with my mom on this. I think they understood that it was wrong, especially after Eve ate the fruit, right? She already knew. This, like knowledge came to her, right? But this is like, um, uh, like effectively like a disfellowshipping offense, coming up with this heretical view of the Bible. Or here's another example, interfaith activity. You go to the funeral of your father, something else my mom did, by the way, who is not a Jehovah's Witness. That's a disfellowshipping offense right now. So previously the question was, within the governing body, or I'm sorry, within the uh, judicial committee, when they convene this committee to decide if you're going to be shunned or not. The question is, are you repentant? Are you sorry for what you did? We know that what you did was wrong. 
and we know that you know that what you did was wrong. Are you sorry for it or not? And now I guess they're saying the elders in the judicial committee can kind of try to talk them into being sorry. They can try to reason with them and explain why Adam and Eve knew what they were doing was wrong, but didn't understand the ramifications fully, for example. Is that the difference? That's what it sounds like. Anyway, so they're talking about disfellowship people, right? And they're trying to draw out this study note about how Paul was really talking about being repentant and how you should have mercy on people and all that. I love how they forgot all about this verse in these study notes for the past 150 years. No, they started shunning officially in 1952. So for the past 70 years or so, a little bit more. Love how they just now remembered that this is in the Bible. Okay, go on. Paul goes on to mention some of the beautiful results of such repentance. It leads the sinner to a more accurate knowledge of the truth. It helps him come back to his proper senses and it enables him to escape from Satan's snares. So I guess this is saying debate people, talk about it, break it down, uh, argue, you know, try to get them to see things from your point of view, even though their point of view is wrong. Okay, I like it. Yes, that's a good change. I'm all for it. Doesn't correct the religion. It's still backwards and deeply damaging to society. But I, it, you know, I, I can at least acknowledge a good change. Yes, we need more now. So the elders have the goal of leading the wrongdoer to repentance. How does a clearer understanding of 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25 adjust our current arrangement? A clearer understanding? It's literally said the exact same thing since time immemorial, since it was written, okay? Okay, really, okay, so we'll say since the King James Version was written. We'll be generous and say that was the first good, full, real translation. There was stuff used before that that was pretty decent, but we'll go with the King James Version, 1700s or six, wait, what was it, 1400s? It was commissioned, finished in like 1450, uh, 1611 apparently. Wow, I was way off. Sorry about that, guys. And they did a version of revision in, seven, in the 1700s. So these words from Timothy have existed since the 1700s or the 1600s. Hundreds of years before Jehovah's Witnesses existed, by the by. Presently, a committee of elders normally meets with a wrongdoer only one time. However, the governing... That, that's the judicial committee, yes. The governing body has decided that the committee may decide to meet with the person more than once. What about baptized minors? Okay, um, they didn't expand upon it at all. That's why I felt it was worth cutting out. I faded out here. I cut that section out. They didn't expand on it. Meet more than once. For what? And one of my main critiques of the religion, you probably heard it at the end there, um, disfellowship minors. Up to this point, it's been getting progressively worse. I'm sorry, it's been getting progressively better, give or take, over the, the past 20 years or so. But officially, according to official doctrine as of like the past couple of years... The position was, if a child, say, 13 years old, hell, let's go younger, say, 9 years old, 8, 7 years old, let's go with the standard 12, let's say they want to attend the funeral of their grandmother or their mother who died and was not a Jehovah's Witness. Their dad's a Jehovah's Witness, their mom isn't, mom dies, they go to the funeral. They're disfellowshipped for it. What now? The answer is, up to this point, they're supposed to basically find a way to get the minor out of the house. I mean, that's the cultural answer to it. The official answer is the kid cannot eat dinner with you. He must eat dinner in another room. You can't talk about spiritual matters. You can't talk about what got him disfellowshipped. You can't talk about why what he did was wrong or right or anything else. In fact, really just keep communication to a minimum. Just like isolate your 10-year-old kid completely. Ideally, you would give him to a family member who's willing to take him in, an aunt or an uncle who is not a Jehovah's Witness. That was like the ideal solution, culturally. So, okay, go on. Uh, what, what do they do with minors? Officially, I think what they did with minors up to this moment was just don't talk about the thing that got him disfellowshipped. That's it. 
and don't eat dinner with them. Must be eaten in another room. Okay, now what's the change for minors? What about baptized minors, those under 18 years of age, who engage in serious wrongdoing? Under our current arrangement, such a baptized minor, along with his Christian parents, must meet with a committee of elders. Under our new arrangement, two elders will meet with the minor and his Christian parents. The elders will find out what steps the parents have already taken to help their child come to repentance. So it's okay. So it's the same, basically. It's just instead of a judicial committee, it's an investigative committee. And the investigative committee asks what the parents are doing to correct the situation, to um, try to set the kids straight. Fascinating. Okay. So they're treating minors a little bit differently. Not better, really, exactly. But okay, go on. If the minor has a good attitude and the parents are reaching him, the two elders might decide that it isn't necessary to take the matter any further. Serious sin. So he's talking about having a girlfriend and sleeping with her, for example. It's, I mean, I consider, I think they consider interfaith activity like attending funerals or weddings um, or non-Jehovah's Witness ceremonies at all pretty serious. But I, I'm just trying to like draw it out a little bit here. Further. Of course, the elders will occasionally check with the parents to make sure that the minor is getting the help he needs. However, what if a baptized minor unrepentantly persists in a wrong course? Like what if he says, no, I'm not sorry I went to my mom's funeral. That's the last time I'll get to see her. I needed to go to that. And you're telling me I can't? Go f*** yourself. All right, so what if the minor says that? Go on. In that case, a committee of elders would meet with him along with his Christian parents. Committee of elders being judicial committee. Yes, he would be disfellowship. They wouldn't be allowed to eat with him. He'd have to eat in another room the whole nine. They try to pass him off to somebody else, some other family member maybe. The governing body is confident that these adjustments reflect Jehovah's desire to lead sinners to repentance. Totally, totally. He wants them to come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. He does not desire anyone to be destroyed, but he desires all to attain to repentance. Well, great. Look, if he doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, then just snap your fingers and be done with it. Put Satan in the pit. Stop all this testing BS and uh, make us all angels just like that. And we're done. See how easy that was? Now, he's got to play all these stupid games with sacrificing his son to himself as a sacrifice to atone for some ridiculous thing that people did 6,000 years ago that he set them up to do? Why did you put them in that garden with that tree? What were you thinking? It's like, the whole story is just a ridiculous joke. ...to repentance. Let's move on to our second scripture. Okay, let's. It's 1 Corinthians 5, 13, which says, Remove the wicked person from among yourselves. That's the one that they use to currently justify disfellowshipping. 1 Corinthians 5.13, Remove the wicked one from among yourselves. Do not even dine with such a man. Completely ignoring the fact that Paul reversed that the very next uh, letter that he wrote. Okay? The Bible clearly teaches that an unrepentant wrongdoer should be removed from the congregation. And really, it's a consequence that the wrongdoer has chosen. Why so? Because he refuses to respond to repeated loving attempts by the elders to lead him to repentance. This, my friends, is called victim blaming. And I heard no end of it when I left Jehovah's Witnesses. Not only did I hear my mom tell everybody around her that it was my fault that she wouldn't talk. I could talk to her if I chose to. I'm the one choosing not to talk to my mom. And what would I have to do to talk to her? Become a Jehovah's Witness again, of course. So I texted her and texted her and texted her and texted her, never received a response, or I got short monosyllabic responses telling me to come back to God and all that other garbage. Worthless nonsense. Not only did, was that the case, but I believed it. I bought it myself. It gets in you deep. 
to lead him to repentance. Even when the elders inform a person that he's being removed from the congregation, he won't be left hopeless. The committee will not simply explain what steps he can take to be welcomed back into the congregation. Which is what they did before, just explain the steps to get reinstated. You have to basically be shunned for six months to 24 months, depending on the situation. Write letters to the elders to convince them that you're really repentant and you really do want to be a Jehovah's Witness, blah, blah, blah. Six months is real fast. Usually it takes about a year, at least. My brother tried for two years and it just never happened. What else will they do? The elders will explain that they'd like to meet with the individual again after a few months to see if he's had a change of heart. Okay, so the harassment continues and you just can't leave somebody alone is what you're saying? If the individual is willing to meet, the elders will make a warm appeal for him to repent and return. Okay, they're they're acting as though this change is just like reversing disfellowshipping. It's not. You, you're still being shunned. Do you know why this is such a big deal in the first place? I need to talk about the Norway thing real quick. Just take a second. Here's the bottom line behind the Jehovah's Witness Norway lawsuit. Jehovah's Witnesses had their status as a religion revoked in Norway. Now, what does that mean exactly? Doesn't mean they're not allowed to practice. Doesn't mean they're not allowed to keep their properties and their buildings and their operations and their everything. It means, A, they're not a tax-exempt status, or they're not a tax-exempt organization anymore. And B, apparently, Norway gives, like, a subsidy to religions in the country based on membership. I don't know what it is exactly, like, what the amount is. But, for example, say the, the Catholic Church has, like, 5 million people or something in Norway. They get $5 million a year. If Jehovah's Witnesses have like 1 million people in Norway, they get $1 million per year. That's generally how it worked from my understanding. Well, they've been withdrawn from that program because of the egregious violations that they're complaining about right now. Oh, and here's C. Here's the final thing that really stuck in their craw. Having their religious status removed also means they can't perform weddings, which isn't like that big of a deal religiously at all for Jehovah's Witnesses, like, seriously, it, it doesn't matter at all. It's fine. It's not like it must be done by a Jehovah's Witness or whatever. They still have to go through the legal process. Like, I, you know, I would still have to go through the legal process as a Jehovah's Witness of going to the judge and blah, 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 getting a marriage certificate and all that stuff. It's just a Jehovah's Witness would be the one to officiate the wedding. Now they have to separate the ceremony from the actual wedding itself. That's the thing. It's really not a big deal. Even to Jehovah's Witnesses, it's not. So anyway, that's the situation with Norway. And why is all this happening? Because they're violating... Well, th this is my words, not Norway's. Because they're violating sec uh, Articles 18 and 20 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. No one can be compelled to... Re to belong to a, an, any organization, and everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community, with others, and in public or private, blah, blah, blah. Articles 18 and 20, they're violating those. Norway has their own set of rules about this, and they said, you telling people not to talk to disfellowship members is violating that. So we're removing your religious status. Again, the only thing Jehovah's Witnesses lost in this process fundamentally was money. That's it. Tax breaks and subsidies. That's what they lost. So anyway, now they're playing up this whole, we don't shun people. We love people. We want them to come back to the religion. Okay, maybe you do, but you're still shunning them. Anyway, continue listening here. Make a warm appeal for him to repent and return. That's still shunning. What about individuals who were disfellowshipped in the past, perhaps even many years ago? Who has two thumbs and was disfellowshipped in the past many years ago, maybe? This guy. All right, go on. In some cases, they may not even recall the reason they were disfellowshipped. No, I recall it. They may have abandoned their wrong course years ago. 
That I did. Yeah, I, I abandoned my wrong course years ago. I'm actually living perfectly in line with Jehovah's Witness standards right now. I'm married. I, you know, not committing adultery or whatever. Uh, I'm not doing any drugs. I'm not drinking. I don't nothing. I like I am exactly in line with Jehovah's Witness theology, funny as it is. But OK, go on. The governing body has decided that the elders should visit such ones, pray with them. OK, I like it. Go on. And make a warm appeal for them to return to the congregation. If a person's been away from the congregation for many years, he would no doubt be very weak spiritually. Therefore, if such a person is willing, the elders could arrange for him to have a Bible study even before he's reinstated. Fascinating. So they'd arrange for him to have a Bible study. So they would, uh, basically, he would be like a non-Jehovah's Witness, like he was never part of the religion at all. They're talking about people who were in the religion many, many years ago, but and don't have sour feelings about it. They just, they got disfellowshipped, and they just moved on with their life, and they just forgot about everything and whatever. That's not the case with me. So it doesn't apply at all. But this is a method of... Jehovah's Witnesses trying to draw in old members who used to be, who were on the periphery, basically. Of course, the individual would have to want to return to the congregation, and the elders would always be the ones to arrange for such a study. Which means they're still being shunned. They would not be free from the shunning until they're reinstated. In imitation of Jehovah's mercy toward imperfect sinners, we want to reach out and help as many as possible to know that the door is open for them to come back to the congregation. The door is open. Well, I don't want the door open. I want there to be no door. Just talk to people. Why is it against the rules for me to just talk to my family? Why is that such a problem? You know, they actually later on in this, I, I, I want to cover this whole thing. We're going to hit the whole thing. Later on in this, they talk about how family members, you know, they should reach out to people who've been disfellowshipped or people who have kind of fallen away from it or not involved or whatever. They should reach out to them and talk to them and try to get them back to the meetings, not befriend them, not have casual conversation, but they're allowed to try to get them back. I would love to see them try with me. I would love it. I would eat it up. God, I would I would probably put it on recording and we'd sit here and we'd chat with them like on stream. That'd be fantastic. Go ahead. Give me a call. Give me a call, guys. If you are a disfellowship person listening to this update. That's me. We urge you to accept the efforts of the elders to help you return to the congregation. Totally. Trying to help me. If you're living in an area where you don't know the local elders, please feel free to call or visit the local kingdom hall and request spiritual assistance. Jehovah wants you to come home, and we do too. See, this is just their attempt to get Norway. I mean, they blatantly lied in open court in Norway. They said, we do not shun ex-members of the religion. That's a lie. You do. At the very least, they did. Until their most recent edition of the Hel the Elder's ma uh, Manual or Handbook or whatever. I don't know if it's still in there or not. I'm not sure. It might be. But either way, they culturally shun them. Why? The Here's my question. I don't care if it's mandated in your books or not. It's completely irrelevant to me. Why is it that a mother who kicks out their kid in 11th grade, this guy right here, why isn't that mother shunned herself for kicking her kid out in 11th grade. That's what I want to know. Why is it not against the rules explicitly to shun people who have left the religion? I don't just want people to not be mandated to shun because they've obviously proven that they know how to weasel their way around that expertly. I want it to be mandated that shunning is banned outright. That's what I want to see from Jehovah's Witnesses. I could not possibly care less about any of these changes or how they affect anybody's lives. They're, it's worthless without that. In keeping with the scriptural admonition at 1 Corinthians 5.11, when a person has been removed from the congregation, 
We stopped keeping company with that person, not even eating with such a man. That And that right there, not even eating with such a man, that's where they get the thing where if a kid is 10 years old and he's disfellowshipped for going to his dead mom's funeral, he has to eat dinner in his room. If he lives with his, his Jehovah's Witness dad, not allowed to eat with his dad anymore. Has to eat somewhere else. That's where they get that. Just disgusting. Seriously. Not even eating with such a man. That means we don't socialize with those who are removed from the congregation. However, again, that was reversed in the very next letter. That does not mean that a Christian could not invite a disfellowship person to attend a congregation meeting. And here's where it gets real. I would be willing to bet every Jehovah's Witness watching or damn near every one of them or ex, you know, ex Jehovah's Witnesses who have been on the outside of the religion for less than five years, I'd be willing to bet that they received a text from somebody, from their mom, their dad, their brother, from their elders, or somebody in the congregation. I'd be willing to bet they received a text saying, come back to Jehovah, please. Will you come back to Jehovah, please? That disfellowship person could be a relative, a former Bible student, or someone we were close to in the past. How appropriate this adjustment is at this time, as we're preparing for the most important meeting of the year, the memorial, which will be held on Sunday, March 24th. I talk about the memorial in my uh, book at length and detail everything that happens and what it all means and everything. It's pretty fascinating, actually, if you want to read it. Again, owenmorgan.com slash book. They're supposed to take unleavened bread and wine, and they're supposed to, like, pass it from person to person. And uh, it's, a, it's around Easter time every year, give or take. It's, a, it's supposed to be like, it represents the night that Jesus, you know, spent with his people, his apostles, and they pass the blood around and the wine, and he's, or, I'm sorry, and they pass the wine and the bread around, and Jesus said, this is my blood, and this is my body, it represents blah, 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 all that stuff. Only certain people are supposed to eat from each. But I always wondered, like, even in prison, you're supposed to observe. Even if you're not, like, one of the people that eats it, you're supposed to have the bread and the wine there and observe the memorial. Think about Jesus and, and the Passover. Pass it to the people in your cell or something, anything, whatever. Just have it. And I got to thinking, does that include toilet wine? Is toilet wine okay? Uh, in all seriousness, grape juice would probably be okay. Or or just your regular bread. I don't know if it's possible to unleaven bread after it's already been leavened. I'd say probably no, but anyway. Normal bread and grape juice probably do the trick. On Sunday, March 24th. What if a disfellowship person comes to a congregation meeting? Under our current arrangement, we don't say a greeting to individuals who've been removed from the congregation. Shun them completely. They're dead to them. It's like they're a ghost. I have PTSD from this. I went to a meeting a while back, years ago now, and I walked in and I was a ghost. If people caught, like, if I, like, glanced at somebody, caught them looking at me, they immediately looked away, pretended they never, they never did. Nobody said a single word to me while I was there. You know who they would talk to, though? They talked to... The person that I was with, uh, it was my ex. She was there with me uh, last time I went, I think. And they were super friendly. And they were literally like relaying messages through her to me while I was standing next to her. It was just disgusting. It's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. That That's their current arrangement. Okay, go on. So what's the new arrangement? However, the governing body has decided that publishers can use their Bible-trained conscience to decide whether to give a simple greeting and welcome a disfellowship individual who attends a congregation meeting. Hi, so good to see you here. Thank you. While we w so no extended conversation, simply a greeting, that's it. Hi, so good to see you here. Thank you for coming. Shake her hand, I guess. Shaking her hand is acceptable and then move on, that's it. While we wouldn't have an extended conversation or socialize with such a person, we do not need to ignore him completely. Not completely anymore. 
That brings us to our third scripture. It's 2 John 9 to 11. There we read, everyone who pushes ahead and does not remain in the teaching of the Christ does not have God. The one who does remain in this teaching is the one who has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your homes or say a greeting to him. For the one who says a greeting to him is a sharer in his wicked works. Okay, um, is, is this, what is this a reference? Is this talking about people who are like, okay, so I guess this is like non-Jehovah's Witnesses. Is that what they're referring to? People who have refused to be a part of it? I don't know. But doesn't 2 John 9 to 11 tell us not to say a greeting to anyone who's been removed from the congregation? It well, I think it's a little more complicated than that, but okay, whatever. Examining the context of those verses, the governing body has concluded that the Apostle John was really describing apostates and others who actively promote wrong conduct. That would be me, I suppose. I, I think I'm considered an apostate officially. Who has two thumbs and is considered an apostate? This guy. For good reason. John strongly directed Christians not even to greet such a person because of his contaminating influence. That's me, contaminating to the core. Therefore, if a disfellowship individual... I mean, like I said, I live completely in line with Bible principles. Um, not only that, but I live completely in line with Jehovah's Witness principles which are different from Bible principles if you didn't catch on already. But that's completely irrelevant, I guess. Because of his contaminating influence. Therefore, if a disfellowship individual is a known apostate or someone who actively promotes wrongdoing, I guess that'd be me. the elders would not visit him. Neither would individual Christians greet such a person or invite him to attend a congregation meeting. Oh, so they wouldn't even invite apostates to attend. Interesting. Okay. Well, uh, that explains why I didn't receive a greeting or a, uh, an invitation from anybody. Will Christians greet such a person or invite him to attend a congregation meeting? In this update, we've examined Jehovah's desire to lead sinners to repentance, and we received clarification on three scriptures that relate to how wrongdoers should be dealt with. In harmony with 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, a committee of elders will lovingly correct and instruct a wrongdoer. I mean, there are like a billion scriptures about how you should bring people into the fold. You should work with them. You should love them and take care of them and do everything you can for them. They just picked out the verses that they liked the most, which just so happened to be the most hateful verses in the Bible and the, the least supported with the goal of leading him to repentance. As outlined at 1 Corinthians 5.13, a person who refuses to repent must be removed from the congregation. So somebody who says, no, I'm not sorry that I went to my grandmother's funeral or my mom's funeral. I think it was the right thing to do. It's the last time I'm going to see her. 10 years old, 11, 12, 13 years old, unrepentant, disfellowshipped. Okay. However, the committee will still try to help him see the need to repent and return, and will arrange for a follow-up meeting in a few months. We also clarified our understanding of 2 John 9-11, to which we learned applies specifically to apostates and others who actively promote wrong conduct. You learned that? Why did God... Okay, God, I love this, dude. This is fantastic. Again, something I wrote about in my book. In... You know what? I, actually, I'm going to pull up the chapter of my book where I talk about it just so I get the sources and the time frames right, because uh, this is kind of a complicated little merry-go-round that they created for themselves. This is a good example of them flip-flopping on things. I love it to death. I love it when they flip-flop on things, okay? So chapter eight of my book, the Fred Franz era, I split it into eras, the Russell era, the Rutherford era the Nor era, and then the Franz era. And the Nor era and the Franz era kind of blend together because Fred Franz was Nathan Nor's vice president before become, pre becoming president himself, and he pulled a lot of strings, uh, Fred Franz did. Anyway, throughout the Nor slash Franz era, they had an interesting view on organ transplants. I have reason to believe, which is sourced in the book, 
that Fred Franz was looking for a way to get Jehovah's Witnesses name on people's lips, good or bad, whatever it took. And that is why he banned blood transfusions. He pushed for transfusions to be banned. Not because he really believed this, not because nothing. He wanted to get himself into the news. But that's neither here nor there. What we're here to talk about in this book is the section, no blood, organs are okay for now. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses flip-flopped back and forth on whether it was okay, uh, whether it was okay to have organ transplants, even after they banned blood transfusions. So 1945, um, Joseph Rutherford dies in 1942, Nathan Knorr takes over. So in the awake from December 22nd, 1949, here's a quote from that, that awake. This is in the Franz Knorr era. Have your teeth or hair fallen out? Has arthritis frozen your joints? Have a hole in your skull that needs plugging up? Need a new roof in your mouth? I didn't know these were things people could do, but okay. Or do you need a replacement for your lungs, kidneys, or heart? If so, you'll be interested to know that there are many shops around the country that are now in the business of supplying spare parts for the human body, both natural and artificial. Okay, not going to ask questions. That's fine with me, whatever. The point is that they were not adversarial toward organ transplants at the time, 1949, right? When was Franz, when did Franz become vice president? I think it was at near the end of, okay, no, Franz was vice president under Nathan Knorr from 1945 until 1977 when he became president. Nathan Knorr was president from 42 to 45 you know, and then continuing on to, to uh, 77. So 1949, he says that. 1961, questions from readers, a watchtower, August 1st. Is there anything in the Bible against giving one's eyes after death to be transplanted to some living person? Elsie, United States. It was a question from readers. The question of placing one's body or parts of one's body at the disposal of men of science or doctors at one's death for purposes of scientific experimentation or replacement in others is frowned upon by certain religious bodies. However, it does not seem that any scriptural principle or law is involved. It is therefore something that each individual must decide for himself. So it's a conscience matter. God might be in favor of it. He might not. So enter at your own peril. If you're going to do this and take this risk, it's on your conscience is the point. That was 1961. 1967 rolls around. Sustaining one's life by means of the body or part of the body of another human would be cannibalism, a practice abhorrent to all civilized people. It is not our place to decide whether such operations are advisable from a scientific or medical standpoint. Christians who've been enlightened by God's word do not need to make these decisions based simply on the basis of personal whim or emotion. They can consider the divine principles and use these in making personal decisions as they look for God's direction. So they banned it. They banned it in 1967. Conscience matter from 61 to 67. How many people died between 61 and 67 because it was a conscience matter? Not zero. So 1967, it's banned. Next mention was in 1975, a watchtower from September 1st. A peculiar factor sometimes noted is a so-called personality transplant. That is, the recipient in some cases has seemed to adopt certain personality factors of the person from whom the organ came. They believed that people got personality transplants. When they transplanted a kidney, they got part of the person's personality. Really. So 61 to 75, it was banned. 75, they ramped it up to 100, and they said, no, in clear terms. Uh, by the way, bound volume, page 519, if you want to find it. The next mention, March 15th, 1980, page 31, Watchtower. There is no biblical command pointedly forbidding the taking in of another human tissue. It is a matter for personal decision. Oh, except blood. Yeah, blood is still banned. That's a, a human tissue, but no, no blood. We're going to forget that one. We're just going to focus in on human tissue being like uh, kidneys and stuff. 
1980, they unbanned it. Now, how many people died between 1960, what was it, 1961 and 1980? How many people? It was not zero. This is reminiscent of what's happening right now among the governing body. In 1947, they released an article in the Watchtower about excommunication. I can pull it up. In fact, I should. I should pull up the article so you guys can see it. Okay, if you're curious, jwfacts.com has been so useful and helpful in my search for understanding the history of this organization. jwfacts.com, check them out. They're fantastic. Paul Grundy is just the best. Anyway, this is an article from page 27, January 8th, 1947, Watchtower, I believe. Or is it an awake? No, it was an awake. I'm sorry. It was it was an awake. It's basically, I'm just going to summarize what it said. Basically, the Catholic Church started excommunication and uh, shunning, and it's evil and wrong and bad, and it's pagan. And if you practice shunning, then you are practicing a pagan practice. You're doing a pagan practice. 1947, they said that. Not five short years later, 1952, shunning was in full effect in the organization. Again, all of this I talk about in the book. owenmorgan.com slash book. Check it out if you're interested. Five short years later, they ban people from talking to their family members if they're disfellowshipped. Shunning is in full effect at that point. And now we're listening to them get new light, quote unquote. God's giving them new light on the subject, right? Well, now God's merciful light is being shed on the situation and telling us that shunning isn't exactly what we thought it was. Well, how about that? Sounds a little bit like the organ transplants, doesn't it? And others who actively promote wrong conduct, not to all those who have been removed from the congregation. Ever since the first human couple sinned, Jehovah has been working to rescue repentant humans. Totally, totally. Why does he need to? Snap your fingers and rescue them all, just like that. Is he all powerful or not? Of course, Jehovah isn't permissive, and he doesn't shield unrepentant wrongdoers from the consequences of their actions. Bro, you made them like that. Are you kidding me? This is all your fault, God. You should be the one fixing it. Still, in his love... Jehovah. Oh, in his love, his love, okay. Jehovah wants sinners to become reconciled to him, if at all possible. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, so he appeals to them to repent. Elders are privileged to be fellow workers with Jehovah as they work to help sinners come to repentance. Our love for Jehovah continues to deepen as we meditate on his love, mercy, and compassion. Totally, totally. We know you'll be happy to hear that the information contained in this update will be published in a series of articles that will appear in the study edition of The Watchtower. Yeah, I've been watching for some of their updates and their changes and stuff, and it's kind of been elusive. I would love to break it down in more detail, but anyway. In addition, the elders will receive direction on how to apply this information. May Jehovah bless us as we work to implement these arrangements that reflect his love and mercy. Before we conclude, the governing body has asked me to read the following announcement. Okay, now, so that's the disfellowshipping section. To my knowledge, that's the end of it. It sounds like a cheap attempt to make Norway think that they are making changes when they're really not, to try to win the legal battle. They're literally just trying to get government subsidies from Norway. That's like, that's it, pretty much. But anyway, uh, this little section that he reads is psychotic, from my understanding. I haven't listened to the whole thing. We're listening together from here on, so check this one out. The governing body has decided that sisters may choose to wear slacks when participating in the ministry and when attending Christian meetings, assemblies, and conventions. You telling me that Jehovah's Witness women don't have to wear dresses exclusively anymore? That's a big deal, actually. Seriously. If a sister chooses to wear slacks on such occasions, they should not be casual, but dignified, modest, and appropriate. When a sister has a part on the program, she should wear a skirt or a dress 
if that is the standard of dress in that land. So um, a skirt or a dress is still more formal, I guess, is the idea. You can dress a little less formally than you have previously at meetings and conventions and things like that. That's my understanding that, it, that they're trying to get across, right? Of course, some sisters may choose to wear a skirt or a dress even when they do not have a part on the program. No f Really? People might make their own choices? How about that? Now, slacks were mandated, by the way. You know what? I'm not going to be that guy always bagging on people. That's not me. I will let Greg Locke do it for me. I'm dumb in a box of rocks in a lot of areas. Or Shane Vaughn. I've lived for the Lord my whole life, and I was dumb as a box of rocks and didn't know it. Thank you for your contribution, guys. I appreciate that. I'm glad that they could say it for me so I didn't have to be the one bagging on people. Now, go on. What were you saying? What was that last sentence? In that land. Of course, some sisters may choose to wear a skirt or a dress even when they do not have a part on the program. In Great. In addition, brothers may choose not to wear a tie or a jacket when participating in the ministry. That is a big deal to me. You don't have to wear a jacket or a tie when you're not door knocking or whatever. That's crazy. Like, that's a really big deal. You're supposed to be representing, like, God's people or whatever to the highest degree when you're knocking on doors. I can't believe that they're accepting this or that they're even suggesting it. Maybe they want to look a little less culty and a little less strict. So they're trying to say... It's really, you know, it's not that bad. We can dress in pants if we want as women. We don't have to wear ties. And when attending Christian meetings, assemblies, and conventions. If a brother chooses not to wear a tie or a jacket on such occasions, he should dress in a manner that is appropriate, modest, and dignified, not casual. When a brother has a part on the program, he should wear a tie and a jacket if that is the standard of dress in that land. Of course, some brothers may choose to wear a tie or a jacket even when they do not have a part on the program. Once again, it's like they're controlling every part of these people's lives, so they have to clarify every single thing. Oh my God, really? People make their own choices. Okay, great. When visiting Bethel, it would be appropriate for brothers to wear a tie and a jacket and for sisters to wear a skirt or a dress if that is the standard of dress in that land. We love you all very much. From the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses, this is JW Broadcasting. They're so weird, dude. I swear to God, it is so weird to listen to them talk after being on the outside for so long. 2007 when I left. Anyway, tell me what you think about this in the comments. Honestly, I don't think the changes were that big. A couple of pretty big ones in there. I think that this is really just an attempt to sidestep the Norway stuff. So anyway, I don't know. Let me know. Let me know what you think. I want to hear from you.